Good evening. Welcome to the November 20th, 2014 Northampton City Council meeting. I'm City Council Vice President Jesse Adams. I'll be chairing tonight in the absence of Council President Bill Dwight. I'll try to be as efficient as possible tonight because we have a very long agenda. We're going to start with public comment first. And um, I just want to point out that there, there are different uh, sign-up sheets for public comment. There's, well, there's one for public comment. There's one for the tax classification hearing that will be at 8 p.m. And there's one for a poll petition hearing for Maple Street in Florence. And there are also handouts next to the podium on the chair of the agenda and the and tax classification documents as well. So we'll start now with public comment. Each member of the public who would like to speak has three minutes. The period will not be interactive. Mr. Tom Pease, if you could stay, state your name and your address, please. My name is Tom Pease, and I live at 130 Spring Street, Florence, Mass. I am presently the commander at the VFW Post 8006 in beautiful downtown Florence. Uh, <laughs> this evening, I'm here on behalf of the Post. This Thanksgiving, a week from today, the VFW in Florence will be providing a free Thanksgiving Day dinner turkey dinner with all the fixings, coffee, dessert, absolutely free to the public. Uh, it's happening from 1 to 5 in the afternoon. The doors will open at 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anyone, anyone is welcome to come. Homeless, if you're a veteran, uh, you just want some company, uh, you can't afford a meal, whatever, but anyone in the community is welcome to come and join us from 1 to 5 next Thursday afternoon, Thanksgiving Day. Um, we would appreciate an RSVP at the telephone number would be 584-8006 by Monday, Tuesday at the latest, but we'd like it on Monday, November the 24th. Um, again, uh, anyone is welcome to come. Please come and join us. This is the first time we've done this, and we're, we just want to give back to the community. And at this time, I'd like to give a special thanks out to my staff who have, uh, they headed this up. They came up with this idea themselves, especially our steward, adjutant, and our executive chef, Kathy Silva, and all of her volunteers. They're doing all of this. They've run around town. They've gotten a lot of donations from a lot of people. So again, anyone is welcome to come and join us next Thursday from 1 to 5. Again, that phone number is 584-8006. And just leave your name and how many people, and it's on us. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Peace. Attorney Bill Newman. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening. I'm Bill Newman. I live on Lyman Road here in Northampton, and my office also is in Northampton, and I'm the director of the Western Massachusetts Office of the American Civil Liberties Union. I've come to the council tonight because there will be, I understand, introduced to this meeting a resolution supporting the executive policy order on police procedures that was initiated and put into effect by Mayor Narkowitz. There are t three pieces at the beginning I'd like to especially bring to your attention and two at the end. The resolution will begin whereas the city of Northampton has been and continues to be enriched by the contributions of community members who have traveled from all points of the globe to make their home here. And whereas Northampton, Northampton is a welcoming city, it seeks to ensure public safety and trust between law enforcement and all members of the community. And whereas, and I think this is singularly important, whereas there is no legal authority on, upon which the federal government may compel, there is no legal authority upon which the federal government may compel an expenditure of city resources to comply with an immigration, customs enforcement, and ICE detainer request. And so it goes on for some, and in some detail, to support the mayor's executive order regarding how the police will, in certain circumstances, deal with ICE detainers, which is to say that they are not binding upon the city. And like many other municipalities and governmental authorities, we will not comply with the request. If there's, of course, a warrant outstanding or a criminal warrant, that's something different. And we all know that. But a civil ICE detainer will not be honored, and it should not be honored, and that's why so many communities across America are in, are in fact passing, endorsing, or otherwise taking action to put into effect what is, in effect, the Trust Act. 
It ends resolved that the City Council, the Northampton City Council, resolutely supports the spirit and intent of the executive policy order and resolve further that the Northampton City Council will use its authority to assure these protections are applied consistently and fairly. I think it is important that the Northampton City Council use its voice as a legislative body and as representatives of the community to say, we stand behind this resolution. We stand with the communities who have come to Northampton, who call Northampton home. We are going to be a welcoming community. We are going to have a community in which there is communication and cooperation between the police department, law enforcement, and all members of the community. This resolution says that the city council stands behind this in its spirit and its intent, and it will use its authority to make sure that it comes to fruition. I urge passage and adoption of this resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Jim Nash. Hello, my name is Jim Nash of 18 Montview. And um, first of all, um, and I'm here to speak about the uh, seven or more zoning uh, proposal that's before you tonight. Um, first, I'd like to thank all of the counselors here tonight. We've all talked about, you've all spent time talking with me about this particular issue. Um, and that, um, and that, you know, I, I can see a lot of uh, the, the public input reflected in the, the, the proposal that's on the table. I, but I am here tonight to just say that I'm feeling a little glum. And the reason being that my neighborhood, more so than just about any neighborhood in town that I can think of, will be greatly impacted by the new density within this zoning. There are 10 properties that will be falling under seven or more for down in my neighborhood. I mean, so 10 times seven, even if it's just at seven, we're talking 70, possibility of 70 new units. Um, that, you know, my reason for doing this all of these years, I don't know, it goes back like six years now around zoning, was not to pick a fight with the planning department, which I would not advise that anybody do, um, but to have things get to the point, so with my neighborhood, when we got to this point, that we weren't gonna be, that we were still gonna be neighbors and not be speculators. And right now I'm really worried that that's what the outcome's gonna be. Um, I mean, I was joking around with one neighbor today and he said, tell them half a million and it's theirs. That's one of the properties on Henry Street. And that, um, you know, this is, I'm, I'm sad that this is maybe where it could go. And that um, I hope my neighborhood can pull through it and we can move forward. Um, but that's, that's been my concern all along and that's why I've been doing this. And I do hope that as we move forward that as people show up and they express their concerns about the zoning, that they not be labeled as NIMBYs, that they be labeled as people trying to work together to have a neighborhood and be neighbors. And that's what my neighbors have always been about when they've been speaking in front of whatever committee. So um, thanks. And um, thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak at public comment? Mr. Martin? You look pretty nice up there. <laughs> <laughs> right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, City Council. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, the audience, ladies and gentlemen at home. My name is Roy C. Martin, 81 Con Street, Northampton, Mass. You know, a few things was hitting me today. I was reading the newspaper today, and uh, I, you know, I know that the bid got turned down and everything. And uh, you know, we're all in a <coughs> quandrum about the whole thing and what's going to happen with our our lights for Christmas and stuff like that. Well, I'm I'm looking at the whole thing like, uh, you know, well, let's have some meetings and let's go ahead and let's start doing some stuff. Then I read all of a sudden in the paper that the mayor's going to have some meetings and uh, Eric Sauer and the other people that was against the bid all of a sudden wasn't invited to the meetings. I, I just don't understand that. 
I think uh, Claire Higgins did this one time and had some meetings and uh, some people were shut out and all of a sudden they got hit with a violation of the open meeting law. Uh, you know, right? I'm pretty sure that all the meetings that have to do with any kind of business like that should be open, right, for everyone to come to and everyone to join into. Now, I think if we all as a city, right, Eric Sauer is willing to do his part, the rest of the people in the city are willing to do their part, I think if we all work together, right, and we get one common cause here, right, we can have Christmas lights, we can have fireworks, we can have anything we want. Almost said it. But, uh, uh, you know, that's what we have to do, and we all have to work together, right, you know. If you need a leader, well, you can find a leader, right? There's a leader out there. There's someone that can lead everything and put things together. And, uh, you know, honor court wasn't so bad. After all, it helped a whole lot of people. I mean, I, I've been in Springfield, I've been in Hartford, Connecticut. People down there, right, they came up here, went to honor court. People that were locked up went to honor court and they're doing good now. They're doing real good jobs and everything. So, uh, you know, honor court wasn't bad. Uh, yeah, they had some gruff ways and some gruff leaders, but hey, right? But Billy Nagel wasn't bad, right? Uh, he was a good guy. You know, I remember him well. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that if we had something like that, right, where people were volunteering, right, or maybe even. Uh, work release program from the jail where the guys come down and they volunteer their time and stuff and they get some extra credit or something. You know, I think we can keep the city clean. I think we can keep things done. And, uh, you know, I think with the city's help and everything, everything can get done. It has to be done down in the business part of town as well as the rest of town. Uh, you know, that, that's my thought on the whole thing. Uh, I can't see why we're feuding, right? one bunch of people against another bunch of people. One, you know, uh, these people all have money, they all have reason, and they ha all have a good reason, right? We're running it all together. Uh, and as far as, uh, as far as my board, board three, right? I see that there's a lot of changes been going through over there, you know, uh, that new hotel down there, right? That's actually, to me, it's an eyesore, because when I came to Northampton, I came to Northampton because it was a cultural city, right? Mr. Martin, if you could wrap up your time, please. It's been oh. three minutes. Yep. My time is up. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jeff. Is there any other public comment? We'll move into the regular meeting. But before we do that, if I could appoint Councillor Klein and Councillor Barge to the Enrollment Committee. Roll call, please. Councillor Adams. Here. Councillor Carney. Present. Councilor Klein? Here. Councilor LaBarge? Present. Councilor O'Donnell? Here. Councilor Sheriff? Here. Councilor Spector? Here. Now we have uh, a public hearing for tax classification, but that is scheduled at 8 o'clock. So what I would like to do would be to move some other agenda items <coughs> for that point. Mm -hmm. And what I'd recommend, first of all, if, if we could possibly move, uh, if there's no objection, items 9 and 10 together. Item 9 is approval of the City Council m meeting minutes of November 4th. I move to approve. Second it. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And then we'll move to number 10. And if, if the council, if it's okay with the council, Um, if if we could just do number 10, uh, the, the additional minutes, the reports of committees, that'll include the September 22nd meeting on committee, the committee on rules, orders, appointments, and ordinances, the meeting, uh, the, the meeting minutes of the special joint city council and school committee meeting on October 9th, and the minutes from October 15th public hearing on vibrant sidewalks, the minutes from the October 20th, 2014 meeting of committee on social services, veterans, culture and recreation, and the minutes of the November 6, 2014 Finance Committee meeting. Move to approve. As a group. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Any discussion? 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Now if we could go back and we have a, a public hearing regarding a national grid poll petition for a location on Maple Street, Florence. Is there a motion to open the public hearing? Make the motion. Made and second. Um, are there any proponents who would like to speak? Ms. Jasinski. Yes, good evening. Lisa Jasinski with National Grid. Um, tonight we're looking for, it's a, a double, actually, kind of a petition. One is for placement of a poll, and the second one is actually placement of underground uh, conduits and secondary manholes. Uh, and it's actually going to be within the street, on Maple Street. The poll would be... I believe as it shows, it's 265 feet south of the center line at the intersection of Main <coughs> Street and Maple Street. It's just past the, um, the block, um, uh, not too far. It's the, the last pull is just before Hurley's, which is as, as at, at the end of that main block. And this is heading back towards Nantuck Street a little ways further. We're, we're trying to bring three-phase power to the new building that's going up in the corner of Maple and Main, and there is there really isn't a great way to bring it. And this was a resolution for us, you know, to to install this pole. We would go across the street with conduit and secondary to a manhole. We're hoping that um, in the future the it would also, if the fire department ever needs to even upgrade their service. Right now they go out there, they're under the street um, to a pole. Looks like it's been there for quite some time. It would also give access to an um, upgrade in their service. They could uh, use that first manhole. And then we would be traveling uh, back along the east side of the street towards Main Street uh, just, to, just, just to the property line of uh, the corner lot where the mobile station was. I'm sorry, it's uh, 100, 100 Main Street to provide service for the new building going up. Are there any questions for Ms. Jasinski? Yes. Councilor Barge. How many houses? I noticed reading on the documentation that you have, something about some houses would be affected. How many? No. I can show you really briefly. I actually took a little, uh, an aerial view on, a, on the big maps just to show you. I thought it might be a little bit clearer <coughs> to, so you, I could just point out to you if you'd like me to do that. Sure. Okay. okay. Here's the person's block right here. Here's Main Street and Maple Street. The, the new pole is going to be just back of the very last pole. We're going to come across the street to a manhole yeah. in the street, and we're going to stay along the street. Um, otherwise, we'd be infringing on private property, even if we followed the, the path of the okay. sidewalk. Okay. So it's going to be coming here. Here's the fire station. They, mm -hmm. they could have access to this in the future. And this lot, obviously, that house is gone now, but there's an empty lot right. there. So this would uh, provide service here, and if something ever happens here in the future, there would be um, access through that manhole also. Oh, great. Um, if you want to hang on to that. Or no, that's OK. OK. That's fine. Anyone else here? Yeah. Yes. You have to see that, but just a question. Did you, you also talked about underground. So will the three-phase tap into existing conduit that's there, or do you need to actually dig up and install new conduit for that? Yes, yeah, we do have to. We have to install new conduit from the pole on um, on the west side of the street that we're going to be installing, it's going to go underground across to a manhole, and then underground uh, conduits will be going up to the handhole to feed the to feed 100 Main Street. Okay. And is that just well, is that typically work done by uh, the company, or do you, you typically sub that out just out of curiosity? We actually sub it out. We uh, we very often use uh, Wasp Brothers. Actually, there are some <coughs> contractors that do that kind of work for us. Okay. Thank you. Also really great. Um, I'm certain that you take care of this kind of thing, but I just want to check in about the fire department there while the construction is happening and oh. there's digging going on. Is the fire department informed so oh, that they take alternate routes and of course it's all arranged? Yeah, and the and the road should should not be you know should be closed. There'll be I know that they'll be coming over, but they're very good about keeping access, you know, on that as they're as they're getting across. Councilor Barge. Yes, quickly. Um, <coughs> this is because of the new building that's being put up and the owner is there yes I talked with him on the phone he had called me yes i'm in support of this a hundred percent i mean the family has put a tremendous amount of money to put this new building in and i think it's great and um i thank him 
and because we need to have Florence become very vibrant. Right. And I don't have a problem. Terrific. Are there any further questions for Mr. Sinski? Thank you, Mr. Sinski. Are there opponents who would like to speak? Sir? Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Thank God Maduka. I own the property on 72 Maple Street and the next lot by it, uh, which is 74 Maple Street. Um, I don't quite understand what they are planning to do, how that will impact my property. Currently, uh, there is a, a huge transformer type thing that's actually uh, in front of my bedroom. And the impact of the electromagnetism that is generated by that transformer, uh, I, nobody knows. There is so much on the news today concerning the impact of those kind of uh, things to the brain. And now they are talking about a new pole. And I don't know what it means. And that pole, the way I see it, is going to be in front of my lot, which I do have intention to develop that lot in the future. And from the uh, markings I saw on the ground, which when I saw that markings, I went to DPW to find out what is going on. And they alerted me to the fact that the, the electric company is trying to do some work. So before I got the notice to attend this hearing, now, uh, it, it appears that they do intend to extend into my property. And I don't think that is acceptable for them to utilize my property without even uh, my, without consulting me or asking me if they could do that. So the whole process, as I see it, is infringing on my property. And again, I don't know, they're talking about underground, um, whatever they're going to do underground. I, I'm not an electrician, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I don't really understand. She needs to explain in details for somebody like me to understand the impact of what they are trying to do on those of us who live there, who own our property there, and also what to be the future impact in terms of developing my property. I'm 100% in support of my friend there who is developing 100 Main Street. I have nothing against that, that process. But I am concerned about the impact of this electrical improvement, what it's going to do to my property and to my health. And I need that explanation. Thank you. Mr. Sensky, would you like to? Respond. Yes, I would, if you would like to, could you, could you just take, I'd like to just show you something on the map. Okay. I know it's, it might not be very clear, but here's the block, okay, here's Main Street and here's, here's Maple Street. Mm -hmm. And there's, there are poles that are coming down here already. Is this your, is this your property just beyond, just beyond the block heading, this is heading towards Nonatuck Street. Okay. So is this empty spot you're... That, uh, that lot, there's an empty lot there with fence. I own that property. And this is my house here. Okay. And you do have a transformer yes. here, very huge. Uh, on and there the, was a, on the pole. there was yes on the pole. Mm -hmm. There was a time when that transformer exploded a while ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I don't. There is so much you as an electric company know mm -hmm. the impact of electromagnetism mm -hmm. on the brain. There is so much study on. It's not yet clear what the impact is. And people keep saying, oh, there is no cl uh, clear evidence. Mm -hmm. But 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, <clears throat> it will be too late. Yeah. Well, I do think that we have, we have people in the company that would be happy to talk to you about electromagnetic fields. But what I'd like to explain to you is that what we're going to do is we're, st we're, placing, a, we're placing a pole here. The wires- You are placing a pole. A pole. There's, there's, a, there's a, the little driveway that goes in behind the building here. 
And then there's a sign right out there on the side. It's just on the back side of the sign. It doesn't, I didn't, I, I really tried to place it so that it didn't infringe on this lot because I thought if that was developed at some point, a driveway might have to come in. So I didn't want to place it. But it's in line with existing poles. It's an, it's an additional pole that's going in. Okay, it's going to be in the same line as the pole you have there now. Exactly. So why was the marking into my property? I, well, I think because when Dick Safe is called, I think that people mark a good area around it just to be sure that it's covered. This is just on the side of the sidewalk. It won't be impact. It won't be on your property at all. You don't need to put a guy or an anchor, or anything, and, and we would always address you for an easement if we ever needed to do that. But when it's in the public way, we just come to the city or the town. Okay, okay. it's okay. in the public way. So it's in, it's just going to be in the public way. Absolutely, that's that's going to okay. be a pull. Can you explain a little bit for me mm -hmm. uh, what you're going to put on the ground? Yes. From this pole, mm -hmm. they're going to put. There's going to be a, a pipe that's going to go all the way down the pole. It's going to come all the way down to the pole, and it's going to go underground, and then it's going to feed across the street here. Here's the fire station. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a manhole. It's actually going to sit in the road. It, it actually can withstand the, with the weight of traffic. Mm -hmm. And the secondaries are going to come from the pole across the street and up this street, uh, up along the street inside. You know, inside the. Um, in, under the road, actually not on the sidewalk, to feed the you know the building on the corner. So this is going to be a pole at this time. It's going to be a pole, and um, it's going to come across across here underground. So it's going to be a pipe down the pole, and across underground to this manhole, and then up to this manhole to feed this one. It can feed this a lot in the future. To feed what this this is where the mobile station was so this okay. is his new lot okay this is the new building so this is going to feed the new building mm -hmm. okay um as a as a customer mm -hmm. of national grid yes do you owe it to me to your customer knowing very well that i live in that place to explain to me do do i have to get this explanation before the city council um i think that i i could have i could have called. I typically, the, the the abutters are notified so that they they do come here, and I'm I'm happy to explain it. And I could explain it further. We don't have to even continue here if you'd like. But I, I'd be happy to meet you out there and show yes, you. Yes, I think I would like okay. for a, a, a better explanation. Okay. I want I want you to be to come out on that street and show me sure. exactly what you're trying to oh, do. Oh, I'd be happy to do that. And how that impacts me, me mm -hmm. my property, and my current home. Okay. Okay. So I can I can show you that I, I won't be in town tomorrow. I can show you that on Monday. Uh, okay. And I'll take your information. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Sinski. Okay. Other opposition? Did I speak, ma'am? I'm actually coming out to have something in record that I did come out and launched a complaint. Um, I have a brain injury, and I have, you know, um, bullet fragments to my head. So uh, we, we already have a pole right in front to the, to, to the right, and now we're having another pole on this side. Is there no possibility of you guys finding a different place to place a second pole? Because right now I feel hemmed in, surrounded by all these electromagnetic things going, going on. So, all I'm saying and appealing to you, if you are somewhere else to put a second pole, I shouldn't have to feel a sense of being oppressed by all these things all around me, because it does, it does affect me. Um, by the way, I'm Dr. Julie Maduka, so um, I'm just appealing to you. If there's any other place you guys can put the pole, I think that would be well and good. So I'm putting this in record that I did get up to launch a complaint and tell you guys the kind of medical issues I have. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Hearing's closed. We'll now move to number five, communications from the mayor. I'm just, I'm just, do we need to approve the vote? I'm sorry, I skipped the vote. 
Now, is there a motion to approve the petition? I move to approve the petition. Second. Second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Now move to number five. Are there any communications from the mayor? Mr. Mayor? Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Sorry about the delay. Uh, uh, just, I did want to um, just briefly update the council. Uh, you may have heard that the governor has announced some mid-year uh, budget cuts in order to um, in order to address the state's uh, budget uh, mid-year budget shortfall. Um, initially, the proposal that the governor had put forward were cuts um, equivalent to about a 2.7 percent cut in our un unrestricted general government aid accounts, which for Northampton would have been about uh, would have been exactly $105,452. So that would mean at this point, five months into the budget year, we would have to figure out a way to adjust our budget to absorb that. Luckily. Uh, the Speaker of the House uh, announced today that that will that the legislature will not allow that to happen. They the governor, in order to make um, cuts in those UGA accounts, UGGA accounts, does need the permission of the legislature to do that, and the legislature has already indicated that they will not bring that up in this session, um, which effectively eliminates it. That still does leave some mid-year budget cuts, and I'll just give you a quick summary. Um, charter tuition reimbursement uh, will be cut by 1.5 percent. This means that Northampton will receive um, a cut to its reimbursement, which I will note for the record was not actually fully funded as it was, of $7,144. And library aid, which is primarily aid that goes to both Forbes and the Lilly Library, will absorb a 1.5 percent cut, um, which for Northampton libraries is about $743. So, um, so again, close to about $8,000 of what could have been uh, over $100,000 um, but I did want to update you because I know that story has been circulating how cities and towns were going to be facing cuts. Obviously, any cut is, uh, is disruptive, um, particularly for our libraries and, and, and for our schools. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful to the legislature for um, holding firm on the budget because it is disruptive for us to have to change um, budgets, especially uh, this, this far into the budget year. So that's my update. Are there any questions for the mayor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Move to number six. Are there any proclamations, <coughs> resolutions, recognitions, or one-minute announcements or events? We do have one resolution. And um, would the council like to take it now? When 8 o'clock comes, we, we do have to do the tax classification hearing, but do we think we can? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Is there a motion to first reading? So moved. Second. Okay, um, I'll read it. In City Council, November 20th, 2014, upon the recommendation of City Councilors Jesse M. Adams, Paul D. Spector, and Elisa F. Klein, resolution supporting the Executive Policy Order on Police Procedures. Whereas the Northampton, the City of Northampton has been and continues to be enriched by the contributions of community members who have traveled from all points of the globe to make their homes here, and Whereas Northampton is a welcoming city, welcoming city that seeks to ensure public safety and trust between law enforcement and all members of our community, and whereas there is no legal authority, authority upon which the federal government may compel an expenditure of city resources to comply with an immigration and customs enforcement detainer request, and whereas transparency and responsibility using state tools or trust act, versions of which are pending before state and federal legislatures aim to keep immigrants who pose no risk to society safe in their communities and with their families while also promoting trust between the immigrant community and local law enforcement. And whereas, according to the Massachusetts Trust Coalition, which includes State Senator Jamie Eldridge and former State Represent Representative Carl Sorrentino, 
ICE issued more than 5,000 detainers in Massachusetts from 2008 through 2011, and more than 75% of these detainers were placed on individuals who had no criminal conviction or history. Several were issued on children under the age of 18, and whereas in April 2014, a federal judge ruled that it is, it is a violation of constitutional rights to hold an individual for immigration authorities without probable cause, and whereas as a result of this ruling, cities and counties nationwide are beginning to revise their policies regarding voluntary cooperation with ICE detainer requests. And whereas on, <clears throat> on August 18, 2011, the Northampton City Council, with the cooperation of Northampton Police Chief Russell Sinkowitz, resolved that community members would not be subjected to civil immigration detainer requests or administrative immigration warrants issued by ICE or Customs and Border Patrol. And whereas that resolution, that resolution has served as the de facto policy of the Northampton Police Department since its passage. And whereas on August 28, 2014, Mayor David J. Narkowitz issued an executive policy order asserting that it shall be the continuing policy of the city of Northampton to assure equal, just, and fair treatment of all persons who live in and visit the city. And in furtherance of that policy, the chief of police shall develop formal departmental policies and procedures implementing the following. One, directing Northampton Police Department personnel to not honor or enforce any detainer request from U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement that is non-criminal and not subject to a judicially issued warrant. Two, directing Northampton Police Department personnel to allow motor vehicles, motor vehicle operators stopped for a violation and found to be unlicensed a reasonable opportunity to arrange for a properly licensed operator to drive the vehicle, regardless of immigration status. Nothing in such policy shall apply to violations that are subject to a statutory or regulatory requirement of vehicle impoundment. impoundment. Three, continuing and enhancing existing pro programs and procedures of the Northampton Police Department to allow access by immigrants to police services in their native languages. Four, providing for record keeping with regard to the policies set forth herein, which can be made available to the mayor upon request. Now therefore be resolved that the Northampton City Council resolutely supports the spirit and intent of this executive policy order, and be it further resolved that the Northampton City Council will use its authority to assure these protections are applied consistently and fairly, and be it further resolved that the Northampton City Council calls upon other communities, <coughs> the Massachusetts Legislature, the Governor of the Commonwealth, Congressman James McGovern, Senators Elizabeth Warren and Edward Markey, and President Barack Obama to pursue and enact similar protections to further the American principles of justice, truth, and security. Yes. Councilor Spector. It's kind of ironic, but in about, I think it's 20 minutes, the President is going to make an address to the nation where he's addressing these very concerns and redirecting the Immigration Services of Homeland Security to redirect their efforts only towards criminal activities and immigrants and to essentially do exactly what's, what's here. Uh, it's interesting it's going to happen right after this. I guess the President will listen to us and immediately change policies. But it's, it, we didn't, just so folks know, this is, uh, it's kind of ironic or serendipitous, but it's, it's actually purely a coincidence because this has been in the works for a long time and that we're talking about it just a few minutes before the President is going to make a speech which will even more forcefully uh, affect people than this particular resolution. But I'm, I'm proud of this city for leading the way, um, as it always does, on issues of civil rights and human rights. And I, I hope we'll support this unanimously. If I could just point out, um, Councilors Klein, Specter, and I began working on this issue with uh, members of the Just Communities organization earlier this year. And we were trying to determine what form the policy should take place in. And during those discussions, um, the mayor proactively went ahead and enacted the executive policy, which we all supported and wanted to follow up with this, which is the council's um, affirmation and approval of that. Councilor Carney. I want to thank the three councilors that sponsored this, that drafted it. And um, I also met with members of Just Communities, as did, I'm sure, most of our colleagues. Um, I, I guess my sense is, I, I, while my name is not as a sponsor on this resolution, I am fully in support of uh, the intent and the wording and 
the general principles. Um, I'm really appreciative of the comments we heard this evening from Attorney Bill Newman, and it, it is time and it is appropriate and the right thing for the city to do. So thanks to my fellow councilors for offering this tonight. Thank you. Sir, Councilor LaBarge? Yes, um, I also want to echo what Councilor Carney had just stated. I want to thank the three councilors for putting this resolution in place. I think listening to um, Bill Newman for open public session meant a lot to me. And as a city councilor, I do stand behind this resolution. I feel that this form of a resolution should be the continuing policy of our city of Northampton. It assures equal and fair treatment of all persons living in our city and people who visit our city. So I do support the intent of this executive policy. Is there any other comment from councilors? Ms. Munoz from the uh, Human Rights Commission would like to be recognized. Would anybody like to move to that? Move effect? to recognize. Second. Seconded. Seconded. Uh, is all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much, and thank you for putting together this resolution. The, uh, we on the Human Rights Commission obviously back anything that uh, addresses human rights and civil rights. Este, the, we encourage you, in terms of language access, there's going to, to, to be inclusive, to call in, say, the Center for New Americans, to call in the principals of the schools, to call in Casa Latina, to be part of that process when you're coming up with some policy on how are we, as a city, going to be welcoming in that way to then include people for whom English is not the primary language. So if somebody is having a, an emergency situ situation right now and you call 911, first, as many of us may know, um, you, first, you first go to a dispatcher who wants to know where you are, and then you go to another dispatcher who will then respond to your emergency. If you do not speak English, then you go to a third dispatcher. Now, if you're in an emergency situation where every second counts, that does not work. And I don't know, and I don't know if the city of Northampton keeps records of how many attempts have been made to get in touch with emergency services, but for language reasons, barriers, the call did not progress where it should have. I don't know how many people do not call the police on issues such as, say, domestic violence because there's a language issue or because they're having trouble with their, their, their children este, or they don't go to the school department because there's an issue with language there. So language access, it's really great that it's in the resolution. And what it needs is the, the, the uh, what it needs is so the city of Northampton to say, for the people who work for the city of Northampton, uh, we have worked out something with, say, Smith College so you can take language classes there. You don't have to pay for it, for those people who are interested in learning language. For the contracts that Northampton uh, the seals with emergency services, to look, to ask, to, to do cultural competence, to ask and say, well, how many people in this ambulance service are bilingual? And what are the languages that they speak? Because if we're going to be real about language access, then we have to be very detailed and inclusive about hearing those different voices. She's here. And I understand that we're United States of America and English is the official language. Let's just get past that. The reality is that there are people who do not master English yet and they may have an emergency. So if we can be of service in this process, we being the Human Rights Commission, please let us know. Please let me know. Because we are very committed to making sure that this language access issue is robust. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Just, just quickly to the point that uh, Ms. Munoz pointed out. Um, I think the first attempts to make an official language in the United States were in the mid-19th century when the majority of speakers in the then United States of America were German speakers. And the motion in, in Congress was to make German the official language of the United States. In their infinite wisdom, Congress rejected that. And I think we stand right now with no official language, which is the wise policy for this country. As in, in Europe, 
it is common for people to be bi or trilingual. And I just hope that uh, the United States of America takes every opportunity it can to encourage people to learn more languages and to reject any, eff any efforts to uh, make English an official language when we know that so many, many people speak so many different languages in this country and, con and continue to encourage learning mul multilingualism. So just my comments on that. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Spector. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. Um, if it pleases the council, what I'd like to do is to move to, while we're still waiting for 8 o'clock to come around, to move to the appointments to committees. Um, and take some of these as a group. Um, if anybody has, if there, are, if, if there are no objections, what I'd like to do is read them all and then take them all as a group. If, if anybody wants to be separated, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. All candidates received positive recommendations from the Committee on Rules, Orders, Appointments, and Ordinance on November 10, 2014. The appointments to the Recreation Commission. Julia Siobhan of 8 Cosmian Avenue, Florence. Yvonne Keith of 40 Hickory Drive, Florence. Appointments to Council on Aging. Alexis Pelliura, 145 Spring Street, Florence. Human Rights Commission. Carolyn Toll Oppenheim, 3 Montview Ave, Northampton. Board of Almoners. Susan Stubbs of 13 Trumbull Road. Pat Patricia Ahern of 24th Street. Joseph Misterka of 312 Chesterfield Road. Michael Shaughnessy of 153 Bridge Street. And the Trust, Conf Trust Fund Committee. Bill Williams of 11 Barrett Place. David Herships of 22 Warburton Way, and Gerald Budger of 127 Bridge Street. Is there a motion to? Make a motion to approve Second. and Second. take it all as a group. Second. Is there any as discussion? Is there any discussion on, on any of these appointments? Uh, no. Correction, just to pronounce uh, Ms. Julia <laughs> Chevin, please. Chevin, thank you. I just want to speak um, in support of two of these folks who I know personally and think are really extraordinary. I think that uh, the Recreation Commission will be very, very lucky to have Julia Shevin as, uh, as a member and Alexis Pellura, um, who is, uh, excuse me, a resident of Florence, who I know well, who um, will be wonderful on the Council on Aging. Councilor Barge. Yes, I also want to talk about Alexis. I've heard so much from her, from um, many seniors at the Senior Center, of how she was very, very active down there. So I'm very pleased about her going on to the um, Council on Aging Board. My question is that I'd like to know from the consular, somebody speak from appointments. Because Paul and I and Pamela were on appointments and evaluations, we had many people that we could not and who could not make appointments to come to be interviewed. My question is, are you interviewing people in the evening? Are you? outright interviewing people in the evening and or are you making the calls? Go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, well, Please. Yeah. in the cases, uh, what we have been doing is those of us who know people personally have taken that opportunity to, since we have met them many times in the flesh, taken the opportunity to actually make the phone call and ask the specific direct questions um, and in that respect, uh, and, and we've also offered opportunities for any of those should they wish to come in in person and meet in addition to the conversation that we've had with them on the phone um, and also offered them the opportunity once we've told them that they've been recommended to come before City Council and then have the opportunity to again be introduced has been the general policy. Okay, the reason why I asked that, which you know, I mean, our committee before was kind of like scrutinized because people could not come in to be interviewed. So that was my question. Two appointments, 
if you were having difficulties getting people to come in during the evenings, like we had problems, but people could not come in the evenings either, so we had to make calls. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Did you have more to add? Uh, no, I think you covered it well. I'd like to thank all the um, appointments, including Mr. Budger, who's here tonight. Um, so there's a motion made and seconded. There's no further discussion. All in favor of accepting of accepting all the appointees? Aye. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? What I'd like to try to do is get something in before 8 o'clock, and I think we might be able to do uh, number 8, the licenses and petitions section. Yeah. Um, the Northampton Center for the Arts is petitioning for a display of fireworks on the on first night. And with us is Ms. Penny Burke from the Center for the Arts. Move to recognize Ms. Burke. Second. All those in favor? Uh, good evening. I'm Penny Burke. I'm executive director of the Northampton Center for the Arts. Despite anything you might have heard to the contrary, there will be fireworks on first night, and I'm here to ask for your approval for our permit. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Burke? Thank you. What time will they be again? Uh, 6 15 p.m. from the roof of the parking garage. And just so along that line, um, have we arranged then for any uh, stoppage of traffic? or <clears throat> Yes. Well, I've met with the police. I, in fact, I met with the police department today, um, and everything's been permitted through the fire department. There's actually no changes in the kind of logistics that we've had in probably the past four or five years. So. Everything looks to be in order. Council of Barge? Yes. Thank you, Penny, and thank you and your volunteers for making this a great evening on December 31st, and which we also know if it's bad weather, it's going to be on January 1st, same time, correct? Yes. We don't even, we never talk about bad weather. <laughs> but you, but that's you not permitted. Here, Penny. <laughs> that's right. I, that's actually always been a part of the, the contract. If for some reason it has to be canceled, that we would try to have it on January 1st. But as for the last 12 times I've done this, we've had it on December 31st. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any further questions for Ms. Burke? Is there any, well, is there any further discussion? Uh, is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Permit? Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Um, well, we now have about seven minutes left. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burke. <laughs> Mr. Foote, how long do you think your presentation will be? Ten minutes. Would we like to have Mr. Foote present and then um, go back yeah. to the... I'm wondering if Miss Callahan's will be shorter. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Callahan, how, how long do you do you Two think minutes. your presentation would take? Oh, that'll be that's good. Two, Two minutes. minutes. Two. All right. We don't want to cut anyone short. Mine's about, so, mine's about three or four minutes. Is that it? There you okay. Go. Okay. Okay. So why don't we move to the the annual recognition of certified living wage and aspiring living living wage employers. Presented by Kitty Callahan of Living Wage, Western Mass. Thank you. On, on behalf of um, Living Wage, Western Mass, um, I'm very honored to have the the City Council honoring um, our certified um, living wage and aspiring employers for 2014 so far. And um, the living wage rate for 2014 was $12.97 an hour. And we had, um, and, and that's based on a basic needs budget for one person with no other household members. Um, and we had 38, we so far have 38 employers who are paying all of their employees at least $12.97 an hour, and we have six employers who are working. They are aspiring and working towards paying a living wage. Um, I want to briefly say that um, this year, for the first time, we have started certifying employers 
throughout Western Mass, and um, the living wage rate for that for for that category of employers is eleven dollars and ninety eight cents an hour due to lower housing costs. Um, and next year we will start certifying employers in Amherst, which have even higher housing costs than um, Northampton, and we're still working on calculating that that level. Um, so, but in Western Mass, so far we have eight employers, seven who are paying at least a living wage and one who is aspiring to pay a living wage. So let me get down to the announcement of the certified employers. Alcraft Facial Plastic Surgery, the Berkshire De Design Group, Borough Weiss Mints and Lippy Yellow LLP, Center for New Americans, Chamber Advisory Board, Collective Copies, Community Legal Aid, DeLong Construction, Edwards Church, Etheridge and Stoyer, First Churches of Northampton, Fly by Night, Gazebo, Indigo Coffee, The Jam Grub, Grub Group, Jekinowski and O'Neill, Law Office of Jesse Adams, Lesser Newman and Nasser, The Literacy Project, Market Street Research, the Media Education Foundation, Minuteman Pest Control, National Priorities Project, Nanotorque Resources Associates, Northampton Area Pediatrics, Northampton Community, Community Music Center, Northampton Friends Meeting, Northampton Housing Authority, and Northampton Survival Center, Ostrander Law Office, Richards Plumbing and Heating, Unitarian Society of Northampton Florence, United Way of Hampshire County, Valley Home Improvement, Valley Community Development Corporation, Valen Medi Spa, Weber and Grinnell Insurance Agency, Wall Family Dentistry, and, that, and then um, our aspiring employers for 2014 are Barton's Angels, City of Northampton, Community Action, Raven Use Books, River Valley Market, and Safe Passage. Thank you. Just a question. Do employers or business owners come forward to you, or do you go out and try and contact all of them? How does it work in terms of um, them both some, knowing about it and getting in touch with you? Mostly, mostly we do outreach. We do get some who are approaching us, but mostly it's, it's outreach that we do. Okay, thank you. Councilor O'Donnell. I was just wondering, um, you have a living wage rate for the city of Northampton, and then you mentioned another lower one. What, what geographic area does that rate? Well, that's on? actually the, wet, the rest of Western Mass, of except for Amherst, which okay. we're going to have a higher rate because their housing costs are, are higher than Northampton. Thank you. And just for some of your calculations are based on the work done <coughs> Am I correct? That's correct. About the Crittenden Women's Union? Right. It, and it's, ba it's actually based on, um, they did a calculation that we used when the resolution was passed in 2010. Yes. We're actually using that same calculation because of the fact that they, they started downgrading their numbers after that, shortly after that. And, and, and so we've been doing, in, increasing that amount by the Consumer Price Index based on the resolution since then. Thank you. Councilor Barge. Yes. Kitty, I want to thank you and thank all your volunteers and the people who are involved doing such a tremendous job on the researching of getting out there and letting people know how important it is that they come forth and look at that living wage. and. Um, I think this is great, and I do remember of that resolution in 2010. I was here. Everybody was yeah. very, very pleased about that resolution. Yes, yes, and I think the one thing I forgot to say was that we hope that people will um, look at this list and make it a priority to support the, um, the certified employers on this list. One more question. Um, just along those same lines, at one point we did have a little sticker or a, some sort of logo that an employer could mm -hmm. play a placard to put in the window. Or has that st is that still in place, or is that 
We actually, we actually have been planning that for years, yes. and we actually, it's, it's been designed by our city councilor Ryan, <laughs> Ryan O'Donnell, and we, we are going to get those out in 2015. But we've, we've been trying to order it from um, collective copies, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we wanted the Klingon stickers, but they're very expensive, so I think we may go with a stick, uh, just a sticker. <laughs> but it'll be nice, just the same. Thank you. This was in the past. There was no conflict of interest That's with the right. Wage Coalition. So. Yeah. <laughs> Further comments or questions? Thank you, Ms. Callahan. We appreciate what you do, what the coalition oh. does. It's very important. Thank you. Thank you. It's 8 o'clock now, so we'll move to the tax classification public hearing. Is there a motion to open the hearing? Make a motion to open the hearing. Is there a second? Second. second. Hearing is open. Um, is there a motion to recognize Susan Wright? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? She's always recognized. Okay, um, you should have a memo in your packet um, about the tax classification. So I'm just going to quickly go through some of the highlights of that, and then our principal assessor, Joan Serafin, will um, take over and answer some questions. So, as you know, this is a tax classification hearing, and the city council, with the approval of the mayor, has the option to shift the tax burden among the major property classes. Shifting the tax burden doesn't raise any additional dollars. It just basically redistributes how those dollars are, are what, which classes of property those dollars come from. There are four classes of property, residential, open space, commercial, and industrial. And the determination that you're asked to make tonight is something you do annually. As I said, it's annually made by the City Council with the approval of the Mayor. And there are three phases to the process. First, the City, and in our case, the Assessor's Office, value all taxable property, has to be certified that it's valued at its full and fair cash value. Every parcel has to be put into one of the various classifications. And then the city may, at its choosing, allocate the tax levy among the various properties. There's a formula, I'm not going to go through the formula, that determines how much you can actually shift that burden, but there is a cap on how much you can shift it to the residential or, or the commercial. Each city or town has to have a public hearing on the issue, whether to treat one class differently if you want to shift. You also have the option, you don't have to give the maximum discount. You could go somewhere in between. You also don't have to give the discount to the residential class. If you want to keep the tax rate the same for all classes of property, you choose the factor of one. If you want to shift it and give the residential class a break, you go below one. And in our case, you could go as low as 87.1%. You could actually conversely go the opposite way and raise it above one, and it would put more of the burden on the residential class and give the break to the commercial industrial class. If you look in the end of the memo, uh, we show you a bunch of scenarios if you were to shift. And Joan will talk about what the tax rate looks like. Um, on this, it's 1581. I think it's a penny difference right now. If you were to shift 10%, in other words, choose the residential factor of 97.42, the tax rate for residential would drop from 1581 to 1540 and it would rise for commercial, industrial, and personal property to 1739. And this chart, that's sideways and upside down. <laughs> it's getting there. Um, if you go to the extreme where you could shift as much as 50%, the tax rate for residential property would go from 1581 down to 1377, but it would rise for commercial properties to $23. To give you some idea of the effect on the various businesses, we included a number of businesses, large and small, local and national, in the list to give you an idea of how much more 
it, they would pay. So I'm just going to choose um, State Street Fruit Store, which is kind of in the middle of the list, a local business. If you were to choose to keep the taxes, if you were to choose a shift of 10 percent, their taxes would increase $2,216. If you were to choose the maximum shift, their taxes would increase by $11,000. So that's the decision before you, uh, whether you want to do that or not. Um, and I'm going to let Joan add anything she would like to add at this point. Is there a motion to recognize Ms. Serafin? Make a motion. Second. Seconded. Is there all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We've talked about this every year since 82, but um, it's nice for the new counselors to hear about it. If I can um, if I can help you understand it in any way, maybe you have questions for me. Um, uh, it, with all the new construction, the um, percentage that the residential pay is 80 percent, which is kind of surprising, but we had a lot of residential const uh, residential permits. And then also the commercial pays 20 percent of the total tax. So that's quite a difference, 80 percent to 20, but that's what it's been for several years. Um, we were able to raise 980,000 in new growth, which is a tremendous amount of new growth. But we did have um, many, many permits and large ones. The new uh, automo dealers, the new medical buildings, um, the new houses that we had up on Village Hill. So um, we probably had 14 or 1500 permits to do, and the 980,000. I was hoping to hit a million, but I couldn't <laughs> make it. Just couldn't make it. That that's construction, new construction that you could, you can count to raise your levy, because they're figuring that you need more police and you need more firemen and you need a lot of extra things for the new people coming in. Um, And Susan gave you a nice um, sheet to show the different, oh, the most important thing, the tax rate's going to be 1580. That's a 41% increase. For 41 cent. <laughs> Excuse me? You said percent, 41%. No, oh. it's 41 15, cent. It's a, <laughs> oh, gosh, I'd have to leave the country. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, a, that's really a small increase compared to what we've had for the last few years. And um, you, start, you start with your levy, and then you figure your um, two and a half, which is about a million two. And then for our overrides, it's a million three. And then our new growth, 980,000. So we'll be raising about 51 and a half million dollars from the tax rate. Okay. Thank you um, for that. Said. Thank you, Ms. Wright, for putting together a nice comparison sheet at the end. I guess um, this goes be the the crux of the discussion since I haven't been here since 1982, but in the last eight years that we've had this discussion, that I've been here at the at the council, we've reflected upon um, the the value of having a factor of one and oftentimes look at, as a comparison to some adjacent cities, so for example, to Holyoke, that does not have a factor of one, but I'm not really sure, maybe you could remind us what the, what the difference ratio is, residential to commercial in Holyoke? I do know they have a 30-something dollar rate for their commercial. They, they went all the way. Communities that have um, utilities tend to use that mixed what I'm wondering is what commercial. the breakdown is, commercial versus residential. Are you saying it's, it, it's they the uh, residential pays 37% and they pay 67% or? I, I don't really know. Okay, well, I just the, reason, know the reason I brought up Holyoke is I know that they, um, they give a, a, higher, uh, a, a higher tax rate to commercial entities 
than to residentials, and mm -hmm. it's significant compared to Northampton. And what we've looked at is sometimes the challenges that that has presented to that city in terms of being able to attract and retain um, a, a strong uh, business presence. Um, I think that some of the factors, some of the things that we just heard, I think from Ms. Wright, that uh, we're actually looking at about 80% residential um, uh, versus 20% commercial. I think clearly in the city we, we are looking to and always looking to um, to increase the, the commercial uh, opportunities, the commercial tax base for the, for the city of Northampton. And obviously one way to do that is to, uh, to make it more attractive to businesses to locate in Northampton is to have something like the factor of one that, that makes you know, their tax burden um, uh, not something, it, it basically makes it a more attractive place to, to locate because of the, of the factor of one. So that's, and then when I look at the numbers that we have here, um, it seems as though what, what residents might gain in terms of uh, tax relief to change that, um, I'm not sure if that really justifies the, the burden that might shift to commercial entity, entities to change a practice that has been pretty successful, but that we've been operating upon, which we've been working, you said, since 1982. What, maybe you could also remind us, in 1982, what, how was it different before it was the factor of one? Did that burden well, shift? The big difference in two and a half was that the, um, the counselors used to pass a budget, and, and we started our recap sheet with the amount that we had to raise. And at that time, we had tax rates of $78. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there was many cuts that first year to get down to the, um, the amount that we could raise. And nowadays, you give us the budget and we work the whole recap sheet backwards. That's all we can raise. Mm -hmm. And we can't, can't change it. Okay. Board. Yes. Are you all done, Council? Yeah, the, yeah, for now. I, I think that okay. is more of a comment than a question. I, I know, Joan, for a long time, we've been into the residential factor one. And Again today, I went to visit a couple of my friends who own businesses here on Main Street, and again hearing how expensive it is costing them to have a business here. We were in a recession, we're still, and we're coming out of it slowly. And I really feel that this is the best way to go is on the residential factor one, because of what has happened when we went into that resident uh, went into that recession and just companies alone were just about surviving so a lot of people think oh you know oh we're doing really great it's coming gradually it's surfacing a little bit so i think if we go and split this factor could be very detrimental to many businesses here in the city of Northampton. It could, because businesses are ch um, being charged the Community Preservation Act, and they don't get any amount deducted on their value. Residentials get 100000 taken off. And then also there's the flood control bills that they've been, just been receiving. So I, I really don't think it would be a very good time to add another tax. And you have to think, when you, say com when you say commercial or industrial, you know, you think of a, a big plant, but in that commercial and industrial, the way the state gives us the codes, the farmers and the chapter land all get that commercial rate also. And also within the residential class are the large apartments, you know, like Meadowbrook and Jack, um, and they, if you passed to give the residentials a break, they would get a break also. Whether they would lower their rents, I'm not too sure. Right. So there's a lot of things to think about. Thank you, Joe. We also had a, uh, a, a very robust conversation in our last finance committee meeting uh, with both Ms. Seraphine 
and Ms. Wright about the various exemptions and those and those sorts of things and the, and the history of, of the tax rate in the city and a whole host of other issues and how to keep uh, businesses affordable in Northampton. Could you could you elaborate a little bit on that for the rest of the councilors? Just sure. We discussed, well, I'll give you a rundown of what I have for my notes. Um, we discussed, they discussed the history of the factor one in the city, um, and we went over the residential and small commercial exemptions options, which are, which are not before us, but which are just things for consideration if, if we chose to take them up. Um, we, we did discuss about how the split in our city is 80 is 80 20 80 commercial 20 percent residential approximately uh, opposite what's that 80 residential 20 commercial 80 residential 20 commercial opposite thank you and um, i asked how that stood in comparison to other communities and i was directed to a, a dor report dor, DOR ha actually has all the information for anyone who's interested um, to compare where we stand as opposed to other <coughs> communities we we're also told that if you don't have more than 20 percent of commercial then typically communities don't classify Right. The Department of Revenue tells me they usually don't classify if they have 20% and under. It's the communities that, you know, have a large industrial base, um, a power company. They were anxious to get that through right from the beginning, and several communities have been trying to change that. It's The Department of Revenue says you never can go back once you've classified. That's what they say. And but communities are trying, but it's a very difficult thing to do. At that meeting, I asked how far back our city's history of factor of one goes, and since Proposition Two and a Half, as we heard before, then we discussed the small commercial exemption, and um, it was Councillor Ciara who who um, asked if there was any way to bring down rents for businesses on Main Street, and um, and the answer was the small commercial exemption could, but the problem is is. Um, it's, it's difficult to qualify um, for properties. Um, you have to have a property of under a million in value or less to qualify. You have to have 10 or fewer employees. Right. Um, and, and most importantly, the owner gets it. They're not required to share it, and it's not likely that they would share it. Perhaps the biggest problem. Um, and then we discussed the residential exemption. Um, it, it, we discussed how there would be um, administrative hurdles to its implement, implementation if it, if, it, if, if it counts. It'll probably take us a whole year because you have to domicile in the property. So we would have to have a lister or do something. It would take quite a while to find out, find it out. Basically, it's many of the communities that have summer places that like to do the residential exemption. <coughs> we also discussed how um, the residential exemption, if enacted, would give a tax break to the owners of homes with lower values, which is paid for by the owners of homes with higher values, but renters may experience higher rents because it doesn't factor buildings that are occupied by renters. Mm -hmm. they, um, would so the higher, they would get the higher rate and uh, um, you have to, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna allow a giveaway, then you have to make up that money somewhere else because we have to have that money to so the city. For those homeowners who um, or finding it expensive to live in Northampton if they were to experience a small break um, from the residential exemption. Unfortunately, renters, some of whom are are, um, are finding it difficult to live in Northampton, would find it even more difficult to live in Northampton if we were to enact such a, such an exemption. Exemption, and um, and then we and then that was that was basically the gist of our conversation. Those are some of the things we discussed. We discussed the new growth that we experienced in the city. If any, any of you would like to talk to me at any time or you think of additional questions, just stop by the office. We have a real nice office now. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any further questions for Ms. Serafin or Ms. Wright? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Is there a motion to close the hearing? Make a motion. Is there a second? Second. You may have other people who wish to speak. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, if I could... If we could hold off on, on that motion. Is there any member, are there any members of the public who would like to speak to the tax classification public hearing? Ms. Beck, is there a motion? Well, you can, this is a public oh, No, she's going to speak, speak to it. Hello, I'm Suzanne Beck. I live at 691 Park Hill Road, and I'm representing the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce. 
and wanted to add my um, support from the chamber for the factor of one tax policy. It's really refreshing to hear all of your discussion about the reasons um, why the factor of one is a very strong policy for Northampton. There's really not much, honestly, that I can add to your you know, very thorough review of it. However, I will point out that the, um, as both Susan and Joan mentioned, we've had a remarkable run of commercial development on King Street uh, at Village Hill and um, the Atwood Drive commercial development and now the opening of the new hotel on Con Street, all of which is um, great evidence that the policy is um, at least supporting new growth and ke keeping us competitive as a community. And I think our most important message from the chamber is thank you. The policy is a good one. Uh, most importantly, we appreciate that you're very consistent about the policy and obviously personally have very strong, um, strong support for it also. So thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else, anyone else like to speak to this matter? Mr. Lapiansky? So I just wanted to make note of the fact that um, on any issue of taxation, uh, I think most people in the public would like to not only have their cake and eat it too, but have the cake be free, right? We want low taxes, robust public services, and a balanced budget. Um, Basically, we want everything, and we don't want to have to do anything in order to get that. It's a very American phenomenon. Um, I think that despite mine and others' criticism, the mayor and Susan Wright have done a hell of a job in balancing the budget and not cutting everything. Um, and so I would be in support of whatever tax classification is going to twist the least number of wrists and get it through without... Um, anyone saying that we shouldn't have these services, which I think we should have. Thank you, sir. Would anyone else like to speak? Is there a motion, a motion to close the public hearing? Make a motion to close. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We're going to take the vote on the tax classification at a later point. That was just the public hearing. Now we'll move to the final presentation, and this is a presentation on the Paradise City Cultural Art Cultural District Grants and Fundraising Events from Brian Foote, the Director of the Northampton Arts Council. Good evening, Councilors. Thanks for having me here tonight. I just wanted to come here to create, create awareness of the Northampton Arts Council and what we do in our city. I'll try to keep it brief because I know you have a long agenda this evening, but... Uh, I don't know if you guys know what we do, but we're, we support and foster the arts in Northampton, Florence, and Leeds. We do it by a number of things, and I'm just going to do a quick uh, overview. Mostly it's by programming between events in our city. Between We do about fifty dollars to $100,000 of programming every year in our city. We give away about $18,000 a year in direct arts grants, and we directly donate... Uh, Seven to nine thousand dollars to provide arts enrichment to public schools every year. So some things we do are two funding cycles: spring and fall, to arts, artists, arts uh, groups, and public schools for artistic endeavors. We also hold four Sundays in February, which is coming up very soon, and I hope everybody attends. Uh, Silver Court Bowl is our marquee event. And then we have three other events on each uh, coordinating Sunday, uh, finishing off with a really big show at the end of February. So we also, you know, we just had a grant round, which I finished uh, sending out the press release today. We awarded uh, almost $11,000 to 24 different artists to do programming and for FY 2015. Um, we had 61 applications asking upwards of $69,000. That is a, uh, the fall grant round is um, administered by the Massachusetts Cultural Council. So I would, uh, you know, ask any of our legislators here locally to, you know, petition the state for more funding because we can only fund $12,000 in projects and we had $70,000 in ask. So we can do a lot more with a lot more money in our, in our fair city. Um, you know, I came here mostly to talk about um, something that's new this year, which is the Paradise City Cultural District. And uh, 
the Northampton Arts Council took the lead on this along with other cultural and business stakeholders in our community to act on an initiative that has been put forward by the Massachusetts Cultural Council. And it is similar to a historic uh, district proposal, but this is um, trying to point out the cultural heritage in different municipalities in uh, Massachusetts. And the one we wanted to point out here is our you know, very flourishing downtown to start. We're gonna talk about Florence uh, later date. And uh, we got together a lot of stakeholders in town and created the um, Paradise City Cultural District. Um, there's a map, I put it in the, you know, in the little packet I gave you. I can have a little camera shot of it. I don't know where the camera is, but it's right there. There'll be a signage going up very soon, these lovely wood signs that's gonna be looking like this. And as you come in on the Route 10 corridor from East Hampton, as you come in from the Route 9 corridor from Amherst, and as you come off of uh, Pleasant Street going into downtown. Um, this map demarcates all of our cultural assets that we have downtown, which is there are many. Um, you know, we have 32, I'm sure that it's gonna keep on going higher and higher. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's fantastic to live in such a, in a small city with such a cultural heritage and, and so many assets that we have here. Um, just wanted to thank Mary Labarge for uh, inviting me to come speak today. Um, appreciate it. So uh, some other things I want to talk about, the, the Paradise City Cultural District. We, um, we had our first uh, um, meeting all together, all the stakeholders with the cultural district that came, came uh, together. And one of the biggest things that came out of it, I think, which is to me is the holy grail of arts and culture in uh, Northampton is a multi-user interface um, events calendar which uh, we're, every stakeholder, we're gonna try to work on programming where every stakeholder will replace their calendar on their website, event website, and it'll be one calendar that everybody uses. Cause you know, we always have an issue with, there's so many different events going on in town. Like where do you go for the, uh, the ultimate, what happens in Northampton tonight? You know, so we're working on a multi-user calendar where you can go to either you know the historic Northampton's website, the Arts Council website, the Center for the Arts website. The same calendar will be on all of them, where there'll be a tab that says this is the Center for the Arts events, but there's another tab that says these are the City of Northampton's events. Now we'll include Florence and Leeds as well, so we can have and we have some plans to do uh, you know to have that going on and the programming behind that. So to me, that was the biggest thing that came out of that first meeting. Um, just to have more awareness about the, you know, the cultural events and you know, arts events that we have in our, in our city. Um, the other thing is come to four Sundays. Uh, I don't know if I have any questions from the, the council. You know, I just wanted to make it short and sweet this Council's time. Very specific question. You mentioned that you give seven to $9,000 public schools to arts programs in the public schools. If someone wanted to earmark and contribute directly to that, can they do that? So if someone donated money, it could go directly to that particular program in the schools? It's, uh, so this is our Trans Performance Initiative that we have every year in, um, in Lick Park, so the Pines Theater Concert. We work directly with the PTOs of each of the public schools, and we donate directly to those PTOs that make sure that the money is earmarked for arts enrichment. So they kind of like figure out and direct. So if you want to direct, donate directly to that, that, I know you can talk to the PTO. So I would, be, I would okay. say if you want to donate directly to arts enrichment, earmark your funds and talk to a PTO, whoever leads it, and then and donate directly to there. Thank you. Councilor Klein. Um, I'm looking at the map that you gave us, and I'm just curious about um, these the 32 numbers you have here. Some of them are businesses like clothing businesses and things. Mm -hmm. What exactly classifies somebody as eligible to be part of the Paradise City Cultural District? Um, so we would earmark some of those businesses which participate in Arts Night Out, which have open gallery space for artists to show visual arts, sculpture, or even have performance there. Um, a lot of the Arts Night Out um, um, participants are going to be local businesses, um, restaurants, uh, you know, retail stores, but they offer their space to artists to display their work. That's fine, so thank you. Is there any other questions, comments? Councilor Marsh. Thank you. Um, Brian, you mentioned about Florence. Mm -hmm. What are your plans in the near future with Florence? Um, you know, we do, the near future in Florence is that we've been really trying to foster Florence Night Out and make sure that that event happens 
still. It's right now, I don't know what the future plans for it, and we've supported with grants and organizational support and, and, and making sure artists are available to um, Donna Bell to, to, you know, to work in Florence, you know. Our arts events producer, Steve Sanderson, performed at the last Florence Night Out, uh, along with other artists that we support grant-wise that showed their work there. Um, in the future, we're looking at using um, some of the space to have some kickoff parties for some of our larger events to bring some more um, exposure to artists in the Pine Street building. Um, we're looking at some, some possibilities. Trans performances are one of our biggest events that we have every year, and it happens in Florence, and it's lovely to see the community come out. And we're like identifying more art space to you know to promote uh, you know some kind of arts night out type of uh, event happening there a little bit more frequently than Florence Night Out. I want to thank you, Brian, and all the support that you're getting from these all these businesses. You're doing a great job. Thanks, Marianne. Is there anything else? Thank you for di Director Foot. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for what you do. I think at this point we'll recess for finance committee. I've been asked to chair finance committee tonight in the absence of <laughs> Councillor Murphy, so that's me. You should put a different hat on. <laughs> She's gonna sit in there. Yeah, right. Roll call. Yes. Here. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the previous meeting? Move to approve. We already did. Oh, that's right. We took we took them. Did we take them? Did we take them? We did. That's right. We, you're right. We took them. All right. Now I'm moving to financial orders. Uh, Four point one, fourteen point. 20, uh, 284 is tax classification. City Council, November 6, 2014, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, ordered that the Northampton City Council approves for fiscal year 2015 a residential factor of one and the attached tax levy percentages. Is there a motion? Vote to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Your discussion? Is there a motion to send it forward to the to the full council with a positive recommendation? Make a make a motion for Second. city council. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. So, the next item is in city council, November sixth, twenty fourteen. Um, well. I'll, the next item is a CPA allocation. So I'll just go ahead and read it. In City Council, November 6, 2014, upon recommendation of the mayor, ordered that upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, the following amounts be appropriated or reserved from fiscal year 2015 Community Preservation Funds Fund estimated at $1,660,000 for fiscal year 2015 Community Preservation purposes. That's in, in the... That total number comes from the 1060000 FY15 local assessment plus $600,000 estimated maximum state match. 182600 from FY15 total estimated CPA revenue to the Community Preservation Fund Open Space Reserve. 182600 I have the, I have the non-revised version, so... Yeah. Those amounts are different. Sorry about that. So, 
So, so I'll start again. On the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, the following amounts be appropriated or reserved from fiscal year 2015 Community Preservation Fund estimated at $1,446,835, which is $1,060,000 FY15 local assessment assessment, assessment estimate plus the three, $386,835 confirmed by state match for fiscal year 2015 community preservation purposes. One th uh, 159000 from FY15 total estimated CPA revenue to the Community Preservation Fund Open Space Reserve. 159000 from FY15 total estimated CPA revenue to the Community Preservation Fund Historic Preservation Reserve. 159000 from FY15 total estimated CPA revenue to the Community Preservation Fund Affordable Housing Reserve. $60,000 from FY15 total estimated CPA revenue to the Community Preservation Fund Administrative Account. <coughs> $909,835 from FY15 total estimated CPA revenue to the Community Preservation Fund budget, Budgeted Reserve. Also, the following amounts be appropriated from the Community Preservation Fund Budgeted Reserve Account number for FY15 Community Preservation Bond, bond Agreement Payment Purposes. Seventy thousand for principal and eighteen thousand seven hundred twenty-five dollars for interest for Bean Farm Bond, and ninety-five thousand for principal, and forty-four thousand eight hundred sixty-eight dollars and six cents for interest for Florence Fields Bond. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor. Aye. Mayor, would you like to speak? Uh, sure, although, it, did you just vote on it? Well, um, I was, well, if, I was uh, attempting to, to, okay. to, to move, the, move it for approval. Oh, perfect, but, okay. Okay, okay I, I, was, I didn't want to interrupt your vote. I just was gonna remind the counselors, this is something we have to do every year by law. The law requires us to allocate CPA funds um, uh, into these specific fund categories. We weren't able to do it at the last meeting, which we would have liked to ideally do it so that we could do two traditional two readings, but we didn't actually get the final numbers from the state on what our uh, assess local assessments were, as well as our confirmed state match. They didn't confirm that until after your last meeting, um, which is why we're requesting two readings tonight so that these monies can be in their proper accounts uh, and so that we can then uh, set the tax rate. Uh, f formally confirm that process as well. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, essentially what you're doing, and we do this every fiscal year we're required to by the CPA law. Council Sierra. I just asked, why, why isn't there a recreation fund? Because um, the recreation has always been considered a subset of the, um, of the open space uh, it's sort of open space or recreation. So it's not given its own separate category. It's just one of the, yeah, so it's a subset of that. Yeah. Yep. Are there any further questions? Nope. Just to point out, there's, there are two readings are requested on both the tax classification and these, al these allocations when we get to the full yes. council. Is there a motion to send this CPA allocation? Make a motion to, to send it to the full Second. council. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Post. Okay. Next, we have petitions to accept certain roadways as public ways. And I think we can take, if there are no objections, we'll take Clark Street, Cook Ave, and Massasoit Ave as a group. Yes. Um, well, would anyone like to move to make a motion to move these? I make a motion. Second. We send it to full city council. You, you make you make a motion to send it to yes. full city council with a positive recommendation. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Then we have. That's it. That's it. That's it. There any new business? Is there any new business in front? Accept the motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. 
Now we'll go back to the full council meeting. And we're on. On it again. We're on it. Tax classification. Is there a motion for approval? Move to approve. Is there a second? Motion to approve. Made second. Is there any further discussion on this? Council Don. Um, thank you. I, I'd just like to say a, a couple words on it because I've I've gotten a handful of, of inquiries about it, and you know what what's interesting about what, what I've heard is I hear um, I hear the kind of dissatisfaction with. Uh, you know the, the the kind of general dissatisfaction we hear today about inequality in the United States, and a lot of it has to do with our our tax code. And I think the the error that of course is there is that there's this idea that we can somehow correct it by changing a, a ratio within an inherently regressive form of taxation, which is the property tax. Um, but I have heard it, especially lately. Um, for example, when you know um, we we face the prospect of not having, um, possibly not having certain services downtown with the bid, I've had constituents ask, "Why don't we raise the commercial tax rate to compensate for it?" And the answer, of course, is because we're not creating any new revenue doing that way. It's just adjusting the it's it's, it's adjusting the the share of um, uh, it's, it's changing the burden of how much each classification pays. But I think it's, you know, it's important to acknowledge that that sentiment is there and just kind of, I, I would just like to not let this discussion about taxes pass without noting that, um, you know, we are committed to maintaining services in the city and that ultimately we do have to kind of look at um, reforming our tax code, but it's not, it's not here in the city, it's, it's elsewhere, it's at the state level. Um, so that's what I've been hearing from, from residents and I wanted to to make that point and also say that you know the the factor of one really has nothing uh, to do with that with that concern so you know I'm, I'm in support of, of keeping that the way it is Those are strong points is there any other discussion okay. roll call vote Councillor Klein yes Councillor Labarge yes Council O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Sarah? Yes. Councillor Spector? Yes. Councillor Adams? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Is there Suspend rule 14. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion on second reading? So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on second reading? Roll call, please. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Sarah? Yes. Councillor Spector? Yes. Councillor Adams? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. We'll now move to petitions to accept certain roadways as public ways. And I would invite the councillors to take these as a group if they're so inclined. Move to take these as a group. We're doing CPA. Yes. Correct. Thank you. Sorry. I skipped that. I'll have to go back. CPA allocations 14.283. Um, <clears throat> that was just read in finance. Yes. Um, is there a motion to, to accept? Move to approve. Second. Second. Is there any discussion on this? Mm -mm. Roll call vote. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Spector? Yes. Councillor Adams? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Suspend rule 14. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Roll call. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Spector? Yes. Councillor Adams? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labar? Yes. Councillor Adams? Yes. And I'll now re entertain the motion uh, to move, take. Move those uh, roads to be accepted as public ways. As Second. a minute. Motion's made and seconded. Is there discussion on this? Councillor Donald? There's just a small typo, uh, I thought I would call, in, in, each, of, in each of these three. Um, it's in the final sentence. It reads, and further, that no damages shall be payable as a result of the any taking authorized. So I assume we strike the we simply strike the word the, the for each of the third, each of, each of these three. Scribner's. 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 Except the Scribner's error. We'll accept that as a Scribner's error. Thank you. 
Is there any other? What I would like to point out, as the city council clerk has, has brought to my attention, is that there is an additional language that was inserted by the solicitor, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which actually is not in the version you have before you. So um, I do want to read this to you to see if you accept it. The additional language is, um, it's one final paragraph that says, accepting and excluding from this taking any and all water and sewer lines within the layout hereby established, which water and sewer lines shall be the responsibility of the owners of the fee interest in the way. Move to accept that language as a second for all of those uh, accepted roadways. Mm -hmm. So there's an amendment to accept this language in all of them, and that's seconded. Is it, um, Okay, I'm sorry. It, it's only for Massasoit, but thank you. So we'll take it just as for Massasoit. Oh, for just Massasoit. So that'll be just on Massasoit. Um, it, all those in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Now we'll go back to the main motion. You want to take out Massasoit? So we're not doing scaling. So we, I think we can take them all together. It's just that Massasoit's amending them. Yeah, we can okay. still take them together. Okay. okay, so. Move second reading of all of those to be taken as a group with the amendment for Massasoit Street. Second. But aren't we removing one of them, Scallon? That was removed. Yeah. It was removed. So it's three of them. That, that's right. We're doing Clark Street, Cook Ave, and Massasoit Ave. Okay. Thank you. So we're now on second reading. A first reading first with with them as a with the motion as amended um, roll call vote please Councilor Sierra yes Councilor Spector yes Councilor Adams yes Councilor Carney yes Councilor Klein yes Councilor Labarge yes Councilor O'Donnell yes okay we now move to we have um, several several items on second reading and what what I would what I would do if there are no objections is I would read them all and take them as a group. I think that's I'll I'll make that motion okay. to approve that. So I'll read them all and then we'll entertain the motion. Um, Fourteen point two eighty five is benches in Florence expanded from the community on uh, Com commission on disabilities fund. That's different. Yeah, I think. Do you want to take that out? Public ways we yeah. you want to take that out. I was I was going to try to take them all as a group, but we can do that one separately. Okay. Is there a motion to uh, to accept um, the benches in Florence? So, is second. second. Is there any discussion on this? Oh, I didn't hear what he was saying. Oh, also, um, I had sent an email to our um, council clerk in regards to having the pictures given to each one of you counselors of what the bench the bench is will be looking like that um, the mayor is, has worked very closely with the Board of Public Works of ordering them and they're just really beautiful um, because I know there were some questions in regards to the, what the benches were made out of and if you also notice with the arm parts for handling them it's very good for people with disabilities who need to be able to help themselves get up. Um, they are made of, I think it's maple, six foot benches. And we just had a meeting Tuesday night in regards to the plaque. So I think we'll be coming back for some more money to go ahead and let us buy the plaques to put on the benches for up in Florence. So thank you, Councilor. Just wanted you to see what the benches look like. Thank you, Councilor. We're very proud of it. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? So we're back to the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So we do need a roll call on that. Roll call. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? 
Sorry. Next, we move to the series of public ways for acceptance. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna entertain. I'm, I'm gonna accept the motion if, if, if one's made, to accept Cosby and Way as a public way, to accept Depot Avenue as a public way, to accept Edgewood Terrace as a public way, to accept Franklin Court as a public way, to accept Glendale Avenue as a public way, to accept Greeley Avenue as a public way, to accept King Avenue as a public way, and to accept Service Center as a public way. Is there a motion to that effect? I'll move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion on <clears throat> the acceptance of all these? These are all in second reading. Roll call, please. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Oh, I'm sorry. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labard? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sierra? Yes. I'm sorry. Councilor Sierra? Sorry, I said yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Councilor Spector? Yes. I thought you were going to skip me. <laughs> Next, we move to number 13, orders and ordinances. And we have on second reading, Mayor David J. Narkowitz's administrative orders for city government. Is there a motion to accept on second reading? So moved. Motion. Moved and seconded. Is there any additional discussion on this? Roll call vote, please. Mm -hmm. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Would counselors be willing to accept the next four? Yes, take them as a group. Okay, I'll read, I'll read it, and the motion will be to take them as a group. Order establishing the Conservation Commission on second reading. Order to establish the Historical Commission on second reading. Order to establish the Historic District Commission on second reading. Order to establish Municipal Affording Housing Trust on second reading. Motion. motion. Approve. Move to approve as, as a group. Second. M made in second. Um, is there any further discussion on these? Roll call vote, please. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labar? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. We'll now move to the ordinances in support of Mayor Narkowitz's administrative order. These are a series of ordinances that, now that we've passed the administrative orders, require really, really minor changes. Um, to ensure that, they're, that, the, that the language of these ordinances are in compliance and conform to the now passed administrative orders of the mayor. So what I would request of the council is that, is that we take all these as a group. Is there a motion to that effect? I'll make a motion to Second. take them all as a group. Any discussion on these? Roll call. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. We now move to Ordinance 312-102, Schedule 1, Parking Prohibited All Times, Pleasant Street. This received a positive recommendation from the Transportation and Parking Commission, um, and it was and it was referred to the Committee on Rules, Orders, Appointments, and Ordinances. But I'm not sure from this. I believe I believe it received the positive recommendation from ordinance as well. Thank you. Yeah. And if I if I may, I would move we take these next two as a group. Certainly. Second. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of. Moving them as a group. Aye. Aye. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll read them, and then I'll ask for a motion for approval. Upon the recommendation of transportation and parking, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that the Code of Ordinances, City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising Section 312-102 of said code, providing that Schedule 1 parking prohibited at all times. Be ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton in City Council, assembled, as follows. Section 1, that's Section 312-102 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended so that such section shall read as follows. Section 312-102, Parking 1, prohibited all times. The location, Pleasant Street, the side, westerly, from a point 51 feet northerly from Michael Ave 
to a point 102 feet southern. And the next ordinance that we're moving as a group of that ordinance reads, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, provided that the Code of Ordinances, City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising Section 312-109 of said code, providing that Schedule 8, on-street parking meter zones, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton, in City Council assembled as follows. Section 1, that's Section 312-109 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended so that such section shall read as follows. Section 312-109, Schedule 8, on-street parking meter zones. It's amended so that it reads, Lo location is Pleasant Street, the side is easterly from Kingsley Avenue to Holyoke Street, and the time limit is two hours and the class is Class 1B. And added is the location is Pleasant Street on the westerly side from Kingsley Avenue to a point 51 feet from northerly from Michaelman Avenue. The time limit is two hours and the class is 1B. Is there a motion to approve? Both those Make orders? a motion to approve. Second. Is there any discussion on this? Uh, just a question. Is that the spot in front of Hugo's? Uh, in front of the, uh, the watering hole, yeah. Oh, the watering hole. The watering okay. hole. Okay. Yeah, uh, just. By way of brief explanation, this the, um, there's been um, there's a parking meter currently with a bag over it next to the crosswalk near Michael and Avenue, at, at that location on, on Pleasant Street, and um, as part of the process to remove it, and the reason for removing uh, this parking meter, which is what these two ordinances do, is to improve visibility at that crosswalk there, and it's been uh, it's been pending for quite some time. So, is there any further discussion on this matter? Roll call, please. <laughs> Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sierra. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Those two ordinances pass on first reading. We now move to ordinances regarding seven plus units in URB and URC districts. This received positive recommendation for the Committee on Rules, Orders, Appointments, and Ordinances. This matter is on first reading. Is there a motion on first reading? Move to approve. Second. Is it moved second? Thank you. Um, is there a motion to recognize Ms. Mish? Um, move to recognize Ms. Mish. Second it. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Good evening. Um, I have a presentation just to bring everyone up to speed on this um, um, and also to recap sort of the months that we've been discussing this. Um, I know some of your counselors have been have participated in the public hearing process um, as it moved um, from last September when we made these big changes to this point today. So, but I want to backtrack a little bit so everyone, so we're all on the same page. So I'll go over the process of how these ordinances came to you and then um, go into some of the details of the proposed modifications um, relative to the special permits. Um, so we already, in, in a quick background, the zoning already has a provision for site plan approval for projects that are spaced <coughs> out in the zoning that trigger site plan, which is really more of a technical review. So anything, any construction that's other than a single family home that's more than 2,000 square feet um, for a new project would trigger site plan approval review by the planning board and issues such as traffic, lighting, landscaping, pedestrian and vehicular access and stormwater are already wrapped into um, an existing the existing zoning ordinances we also have special permit criteria for specific uses um, in the zoning ordinance um, special permits are more discretionary the planning board can make a determination uh, on a case-by-case -case basis about a specific parcel whether or not that use makes sense in that location that's different from site plan, where site plan is really looking at the layout, how you access a property, um, how it functions on the site. <clears throat> um, so what we have in, in um, front of the council today is um, um, a follow-up from zoning changes that were passed for the urban residential A, B, and C districts last September, September 2013. And at that point, 
um, new building design standards were introduced and there were um, lot size changes um, to properties within those districts. And the map that um, was on the screen before I started showed the swath of area we're talking about. It's a significant portion of the city that those zoning changes um, uh, addressed last year. It also introduced a new special permit criteria in the urban residential C district for the creation of more than seven units. So that discretionary permit threshold was introduced last year with two specific criteria at that time. But there was a concern that that wasn't enough um, detail um, to bring to bear on projects that were considered slightly bigger in these in-town neighborhoods. So at the time, there was a moratorium voted on by city council for the construction of seven or more units in those in, in urban residential B and C districts are the ones that we're speaking about. And the moratorium ran from last September through July of this year originally. Um, <clears throat> so at that time in September, as I said, new building design standards and some site design standards were introduced. We had um, um, requirements that front doors face the street garages don't dominate the street or the structure, um, and that massing and buffers and parking lot layout fit into the context of the neighborhood into which these projects would be located. And those are still um, present today. We're not talking about um, altering those, just adding and enhancing um, those for the larger projects. So after the adoption, when the moratorium was put in place, um, the question arose, you know, what additional design standards could be um, included for projects that are seven or more units? So we started a process, I think probably, I'm going to say January of, of this year, informal discussions with representatives from Ward 3 to try to ferret out what those um, issues were and what, what path um, the city should take to address those concerns. We also had um, a specific meeting with um, neighbors around the South Street neighborhood for, uh, related to the Fort Hill site, which is owned by Smith, to try to get to how we might use, um, gain information and concern from the neighborhood about what happens at that site and apply it through the regulatory process for these larger projects, because that will frankly be one of the bigger build out projects over the next however long many years that might take, 5, 10, 15 years to even come to fruition, I'm not sure. Um, so the planning board um, held multiple meetings from January through October actually of this year. Ordinance committee started um, being part of the conversation April, May time frame. And so, and, and during that period we also had a series of different public venues and forums to further um, discuss these details. And in, at that time, it was determined that the July 1st moratorium date was fast approaching and that should be extended to December of this year so that we could apply more time to figure out these um, details and what would be important to address the concerns. So we had some forums this fall. Um, the housing partnership had a chance to weigh in and look at some of the proposed language changes as well as the energy commission um, on top of the regular, the sort of standard um, subcommittee reviews that happen when a zoning proposal is, is made. Um, so this proposal um, does, um, essentially there are four components of it. One is um, the um, addition of language for to, that specifies that if you already have an existing structure on a parcel and you want to add another structure, even though it may not um, un, be 2,000 square feet, which would be the standard trigger for a site plan, it would still need site plan review because you're adding a new structure to an existing lot that has something on it. Um, the second item is that essentially six additional design components for seven plus units um, were are included in this packet and I'm going to go into details um, on those um, on the next slide and also these um, there there had been a threshold break in the pr previously adopted version that said at seven units you need a special permit but when you build when you go to ten units you need 
these specific items. So instead of having an intermediate um, sort of threshold, this ordinance is proposed to address everything from seven units on. So there's no differentiation um, once you hit 10 that you have to do more than what you would at seven units. And also there's a component that there's language in here that um, that um, gets at phasing or build out, build out of a project so that in a five-year time period, if you build three units and then you come back for three more or four or five more years <coughs> later, we look at that as one build-out project if it's within a five-year period. So then that would, we, we would be able to determine whether or not you trigger a special permit or if it's just the technical, more technical review of site plan. So um, going to the map here, I just wanted to show the districts again we're talking about is urban residential C. Um, this is the central business district here in the middle. Um, the yellow represents the urban residential C district and really encompasses it is spread across four different portions of wards. So I have that's what those numbers are representing the, um, the city council wards. Um, this is the urban residential B which um, we just looked at C, which is around this um, area uh, surrounding downtown, and B is the purple um, that really runs between Florence Center and downtown and sort of north and south of those. And again, covers a large um, portion of the city, and these are the ward numbers that they represent. So we've got B in um, all the wards but, but six. So to get down to more specifics about those additional six design components that are part of this um, package in front of you, the first uh, relates to um, streetscape presence and um, ensuring that buildings, uh, new buildings, are front the street and with parking in the back because that's historically how these neighborhoods have built out. We don't have parking between the street and the buildings um, in these neighborhoods. And uh, building projections and articulation are important if you're talking about building new um, buildings that might be go deeper into a lot and abut existing residential structures. The design of those side facades is, are really important, so that's part of this as well, that they, those side facades need to be broken up and, and um, have different texture and, and um, so that you're not presenting a blank wall to your neighbor that's been there for 100 years. Um, and the streetscape and how it functions between the street and the building is, is important, so adding, ensuring that the sidewalks are brought up to um, code, that there are landscape features, trees, benches, and so forth to make that um, fit into the context of that more pedestrian character that we have in these neighborhoods. Um, another component is are, um, related to pedestrian vehicular co connectivity. So we want to make sure that we're creating paths for people and vehicles to access to the site, but through the, but also through the site, and um, to the extent that it makes sense for those um, um, parcels to connect to abutting streets or or abutting um, public spaces, um, so they're not walled off from the rest of the community. And a third component is. Um, the requirement uh, for additional um, focused design for a civic or park space within the project. And it's not necessarily meant to be public. In fact, we can't require it to be public. But it's really meant to um, sort of carve out a piece of the property that has some, that to create a unique um, public space for the people who live there. Um, and in a bigger context, if it's a large project, it very well could be that it becomes public or accessible by the public, but um, it certainly isn't mandated by this ordinance, but it's really just meant to, you know, we have an open space requirement um, for all projects in, in Northampton and in these districts, it's anywhere from 30% of the site has to remain open, meaning undeveloped with building and, <coughs> and pavement. Um, 
But beyond just having leftover strips of grass um, as your open space, this is meant to say you need to think about and design a focal point for the project that's small but has, char has a character to it. That piece is something that I've grappled with a bit because for me, it drives up the cost of a project and it is not public, as you pointed out. And so if it's going to drive up the cost of a project and not be open to the public, but may seem to be open to the public, I find that somewhat problematic, if you want to address that. Sure. Um, well, it's interesting when we've talked, I've, I've spoken actually with one um, person who does development or helps in assists in development around um, Northampton, who said, you know, this isn't a big deal because this just really makes the, the project more marketable and saleable for us. If you have some um, interesting feature on the site that makes it alive and come, you know, m more vibrant for the buyer or for the renter. Um, and that's really what it's meant to be, is not to sort of require um, applicants to look at a site and, and create something, not just the buildings, but create something else. And this is a relatively small um, piece or um, amount of property that um, would be um, required for that. And it's not dictated how it's done or what goes in there. It's really up to the applicant. Just to that same point, so while such a space wouldn't be open to the public, so to speak, it's envisioned as communal use or for those internal to a development to have more access as a, to make it more of a community in and of itself. Is that sure. the intent? Yep. Okay. Um, so the next three components um, or, uh, of this are um, first a component about sustainability and energy. And there was a lot of debate about this um, at the planning board through public process and then also back to the Energy Commission. Um, but this, people were very interested in ensuring that if we're going to be building these bigger projects in infill that, um, that it's important that we hold these special permits. These are special permit um, criteria for projects and that we hold them to a very high standard of energy efficiency. And so the specifics of this standard are that um, we, Currently, there's a measurement for energy, um, the home energy rating system. And um, the standard says um, in this proposal that building, um, that, that the HERS rating for new construction for these residential units be 25% greater than the, than the current municipal standard for energy ratings on homes. So, um, Currently, we have the stretch code, and so that might change over time, which is why we're not referencing the stretch code in this language, um, meaning the name might change or the standard might change. Um, and in fact, the pr uh, proposed um, piece of this is that there's sort of a, a built-in <coughs> flexibility um, that if you can't meet that or if there's another comparable energy standard that in accordance to or after review with the building commissioner that that would be an appropriate way to meet this as well so if it's not a hers rating for example it's some other energy rating but it has a con it's it's scaled comparably to the hers rating that that could be utilized as well so the the alternative is um, if not if you don't you can either um, meet the standard by showing that you have this HERS rating that's, that's um, 47 for 1,200 square foot homes or 41 for larger than 1,200 square foot homes, or if you show that you're building all your units are going to be lead gold for new construction or lead gold um, neighborhood um, development. So that's the energy um, piece of it. Um, 
The next component is related to size, affordability, and access. And again, a lot of discussion back and forth among um, uh, several different um, groups. And so what's in front of you is a standard that either you create 11% of the units be affordable in accordance with our definition of affordability in the zoning code, or 25% um, of your units are no bigger than 1,200 square feet. And um, the idea behind that is, is there are multiple goals in, in the sustainable Northampton. Um, and one is to disperse affordable housing throughout the community as much as we can. Um, but we also know that if building affordable housing to those standards is, is um, done best by those who specialize in it. So mostly nonprofit housing developers would take that on because it's, it's, there, there's a long process, an onerous process to meet those standards. The state level that's subsidized housing, you need to go through and get approval at the state level. So there's sort of a, um, an either or here. The, the, lar the smaller um, structure size um, there's a lot of debate about whether that means affordable, and most people say no, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be affordable, but there's also a need for smaller units um, in the community and not just um, large house construction. So that's where that came from. Um, and then the next piece of this is that um, equal access to building amenities and projects parks and civic space and public entrances must be provided. So that if you are, if you do have affordable units, you're not precluding people who are living in those affordable units from accessing the other building amenities that are for the that are there that um, the market rate tenants or owners have access to. And then the final component is internet connectivity, which is similar, is that essentially if you're creating if you're building infrastructure into the building that's going to provide network access, it can't be um, it can't be um, regulated to just the folks that might be paying market rents versus the um, units that are for the subsidized um, the people who qualify for subsidized housing. Um, so that is it in a nutshell. Oops. Yes. Um, so this is really about the infrastructure in the building for internet connectivity. So it doesn't, the language isn't saying that you have to provide internet connectivity, but if you're building a project that includes the infrastructure, that it has to be accessible to everybody. You can't exclude it for the, for the units right. that are that you're mandated to be affordable. Exactly. And then um, just to follow up, there were a couple of um, minor Scrivener's errors that I think did, um, Councillor O'Donnell, did you get those to? Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't get them to anyone, okay. so you can so I will feel free to. Those. Yeah. <laughs> so there are a list, um, thanks to Councillor O'Donnell, he went through the whole thing and found some little edits um, that I would um, recommend. Um, and I have the hard copy. Uh, Pam, I think Councilor Donnell, or I could also forward you the electronic copy, but I'll just go through quickly. There was a chain, there was a, and this was just merely left off. It wasn't, um, it's not a, a substantive change to the ordinance, but there is a variation between section G and H in these tables. One deals with urban residential B, and the other deals with urban residential C. And so, at the very top of the ordinance, it says that this language w is proposed to replace um, the language uh, at any multifamily or townhouse project with seven or more units. In urban residential B, we don't have, we don't allow multifamily units. So um, that's, that multifamily term should be um, struck from the um, table G. A and that's the way it was introduced. I think just through all these changes, it just didn't get um, deleted or added back in. Um, and then there's a spelling error principle to principal <laughs> um, in um, section, um, in two, section one. Um, also just adding a space um, 
between words, I think when we were doing um, the review tracker on the on Word, it just um, collapsed the space that's necessary. Um, and there's a double um, article, the, the, appears um, together, so we need to delete that. And then spelling out in section five, spelling out square feet instead of abbreviating it. Um, and actually spelling out square feet throughout the rest of the ordinance instead of having it abbreviated. Um, and there's a period that needs to be struck in the final um, category F, internet connectivity. We um, asking our question. Mr. Klein? Uh, so I'm wondering if I think it's kind of important that we backtrack a little bit for people that might be watching at home mm -hmm. to explain the um, very baseline information here about the fact that we have um, a moratorium in place. This has already been decided by the last council that you can build seven plus units in URC and URB. Um, and this is actually just making sure that we have certain provisions in place for those because I think exactly. there's still a misunderstanding amongst okay. a lot mm -hmm. of people sure. that um, we're making a decision about moving forward with a seven with the allowance for seven unit right dwellings. Sure, and I'll I'll step back um, even a little bit before September just to clarify that further. Um, in the old zoning, pre-2013, um, in the urban residential B districts, we allowed more than seven townhouse units throughout the urban residential B districts with special permit, um, as we do today um, under the ordinances that were adopted a year ago. In urban residential C, however, up until to last year, any number of units was always site plan approval. It never triggered a special permit. Last September, a, a special permit threshold was instituted <coughs> in the urban residential C districts, which was not there before. And again, it's discretionary versus the technical site plan review. So that was new last year. So that was a new hurdle or threshold that an applicant would have to um, overcome. Um, but at that time, the moratorium, as you said, was put in place to buy time to think about more design standards that could be applicable to those units. So it was never intended um, to be um, something permanent. A moratorium is always temporary, and it can only be instituted as you're working on accomplishing something. So you're, you're right. So that, so we extended it in July because we saw that there just wasn't enough time to, to fine tune those, those items. And um, so now it's about to expire December 31st um, again. So if we didn't do anything, um, the moratorium would expire and then there would be no standards in place or they would be the standards that were adopted in September, which are far fewer than what's proposed in front of you today. And the design standards apply to um, dwellings that are seven plus units. Um, what about six and less? So six and less are, um, the, the, there's um, site plan review and design standards that were adopted last September apply. So I had a quick slide up here. Um, that generalize those ones that are that are in place that deal with setbacks, massing, the way your front doors face the street, and and the types of um, um, and ensuring that garages don't do not, um, dominate those those front facades, um, and it also spells out uh, parking, breaking up parking spaces. So if you did do six units, for example, and you had to provide 12 parking spaces for the six units, you couldn't have a a mass of 12 um, space parking lot, you have to break those down into smaller components and landscape those according to the standards. I will say there is another part of the proposed 
change here that does address all number of units going back to unit one mm -hmm. um, related to um, landscaping of those parking areas to ensure that um, there's adequate buffer to uh, protect um, surrounding properties from headlights coming from automobiles and that's part of this there was a there was that that already was adopted last year but this is a clarification or a further enhancement of that language Council the bar um, Carolyn I feel that there's been a tremendous amount of months and months of spending it on hearings and I'm very very happy about that because I did attend quite a bit of those hearings and I think it's a benefit for all counselors no matter what ward it is to hear what problems another ward might have with development which someday could also change and affect other wards um, I heard a lot of people express reservations about the level of infill that would occur in their neighborhoods. And I think because of having all these hearings, listening to what their concerns were, that you worked out to the best that you could to accommodate what the infills and the problems that would occur in those neighborhoods. Um, in, in contrast to those concerns, the planning department has assured that all the residents that the new zoning will not overly impact the character of their neighborhoods, correct? Because I that's heard right. that quite a bit at those hearings. Right, that's the that. goal, for sure. Exactly. So I, I am going to vote to move with these new regulations, but I'm going to do so with the understanding that if the worries expressed by citizens come to be, because I've seen that happen before, that I, as a city councilor, would like to see these regulations promptly revisited, because it can happen. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Uh, just a oh. comment. Oh, uh, please. Um, uh, so, Carolyn, you and Councilor O'Donnell and I have talked about this park space recently and, mm -hmm. and talked about um, thoughts on whether it was sufficient, of sufficient size. And um, would you, could you give us your thoughts on, on what would you think about a, an increase to that? So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no magic number to the 150 square feet. And fifth, um, so the standard that's on the table in front of the counselors is 150 square feet minimum, but 15 square feet per um, unit. So it would go up, the area obviously would go up as the number of units um, are developed. Um, and the goal was, not to have something so big that it becomes onerous, but to have something that can be well thought out and well designed. <coughs> um, and and it's not, there's not a magic number to what that is. It started out as 100 square feet um, minimum. Actually, there was a discussion whether it should be 75 or 100. It landed on 100, and then that got bumped up to 150. So I think that um, if the counselors, and, and you particularly, if you feel that it um, should be a little bit bigger um, than that is sort of the bottom threshold and then 15 per unit so right now I think we, um, we figured that out to be anything under 10 units would be 150 square feet anything over that starts ticking up um, so again there's no magic number that um, uh, um, makes it a tipping point so I think going up is you know, reasonable. Um, if it if it gets to be too big, I think then it starts to be. Um, we'll probably address um, Councilor Adams' concern more about whether or not it becomes so burdensome that we're then not getting the housing that we're actually trying to encourage in these in-town areas that are walkable to services and and um, so forth. Councilor Carter. Oh. Thank you. I, I especially want to thank Councilors O'Donnell and Shara and Carolyn Mish from Planning for 
it, what seems to be a long, um, a long process and a, and a very dedicated amount of time that was appropriate for something as big as this. So I, I do feel comfortable that um, that voices were heard, that that uh, all of the concerns were really aired and vetted, and I appreciate all of the time and effort that went in to bring this finally to this point. So thank you all for that. Thank you. I, I'd just like to make a kind of general comment first and then maybe pick up on, on the point that Councilor Sherr raised. Um, right now in, in the city and especially in Ward 3, in other wards, but I, you know, I'm primarily thinking about Ward 3. Uh, I won't surprise you. Um, we're, we're sort of operating without a net. And if you look at some of the projects that might be around the corner, like Shaw's Motel, literally on, on the corner, um, I want to make sure that if that project goes forward, that it goes forward with certain um, appropriate rules. And I know there's um, lots of debate about the zoning changes that were passed last year, but I feel strongly that they are, whatever you may think of them, they're separate from the ordinances that we're looking at today, which are strictly about larger developments of seven or more units. And I would hate to have the moratorium end with no rules in place. And I, um, I thank the, the council for our kind words, and, and I thank the, the planning department and the planning board because there was a lot of public process around this. And it's the kind of thing because you're, you're making changes that eventually people may see in their city. I mean, you could have endless, endless discussions about this. And to Councillor Labarge's point, um, it is also our, our duty as a council to be vigilant going forward and assess what we've done. But I think we're prepared to do that, and I think our professional uh, planning department is prepared to do that as well and has done a good job this time around on these rules. So, you know, that, that's, that, that's the way I'm thinking about this. Um, we're, we're a city, and by definition, a city is full of um, debate and contradictory opinions, but getting some rules passed, I think, is for the, the good overall uh, of the city, for the city of Northampton. Um, and just briefly, um, specifically, I would like to kind of back up what Councilor Su uh, Shara suggested about possibly looking at increasing um, civic space. It's hard to get your head around. Uh, this, is, this is full of numbers. This ordinance is, is full of numbers. Um, but, you know, just like the cliche about a budget, that a budget is more than a, a bunch of numbers, it's a moral document. Zoning is the same. Um, zoning is more than a collection of setbacks and dimensional regulations. It's a, it's a statement of values to a certain de degree. So it's hard to get your, your head around the numbers, but we really should try. So the minimum park space right now, 150 feet, is smaller than a standard parking, parking spot. And that was, um, that was a fact you, um, you told me about, Carol, and I, f I thought that was, that was interesting. Um, so that, let's just be aware that the, that the park space we're creating is quite small at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further comment, discussion? Okay. I believe we took these two ordinances as a group. I don't Sorry. recall if we did that, but we ought to. Actually, I'm sorry, go ahead. If we could back up and take the amendments that, um, that Ms. Mish suggested, um, do they need to be incorporated? Um, to pass. Yeah. Excuse me, Mr. President. Are you talking about the amendments or the, or the Scrivener's errors that were the, the amendments mean the Scrivener's errors. Thank you. Not, nothing okay. of substance, just, just the okay. language. Uh, I'll entertain oh, Councilor Shira. Um, so I, I would like to suggest a, a further amendment to the to the park space and to increase it to um, uh, right now. So it's a minimum of of 150 to increase it to to 300 um, and or 30 feet per per dwelling. Second, um, whichever is larger. So motions made and seconded. Is there discussion? 
Councilor Spector. I, guess I would just like to understand why and mm -hmm. uh, whether that's come up before in other discussions, because I would just be a little concerned at the last mm -hmm. moment when you just talked about numbers. I think they're important and how you would feel about that. So if you could explain. <coughs> um, well, as Councilor O'Donnell just, just point, kind of illustrated, um, so 150 square feet is a little bit smaller than a parking space. And we, so we've been talking about that and, and had a conversation with Carolyn today about it. Um, and, and brought up the idea of, of making it, um, of changing the numbers. And so <clears throat> at 300 square feet, it would be a little bit smaller than two parking spaces. Um, and my feeling was that um, I've just, you know, I've been hearing from constituents that they, that this sort of civic space that everyone can use is important to them. And, um, and having talking, having spoken to Carolyn about it, um, she indicated that that kind of increase she didn't think would have a negative impact. Um, where I think it also it could have a very positive impact for for the residents of these developments. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there any further discussion on that? This is going to be a vote on the motion. On the, amendment. On, the, on the amendment. Excuse me. Thank you. On the amendment to the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Now we're back to the main amendment. I'd entertain a motion to make the Scrivener's changes as suggested by Ms. Mish. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor? Oh, Aye. Could I, Aye. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Discussion? May, could I um, amend the amendment with a small additional change? That's Certainly. not That's not substantive. Um, it's simply that in Section D, which sets forth um, energy standards. It's, it, the, uh, it has the number one uh, for the first section, but there is only one section. So we should strike the number one and make the sub bullets one and two. If that's, is that clear? We, there's no need to number it because there's only one section, so I would add that to the minor corrections we're making as well. Well, except as a friendly amendment. So, so the main amendment main motion that's an, am that's an amended amendment is to take all of those simultaneously okay yeah. all those in favor on the, on the on the amendment aye aye, aye. now we're back to the main motion yeah. and we'll need well if there's no is there further discussion on the main motion on the main on the ordinance before you ordinances um, we'll need a roll call vote and it requires six for passage being that it's a zoning ordinance Yes. Councillor Sarah. Yes. Councillor Spector. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Passes. Next updates from <laughs> committee chairs. No, you've got some more referrals. Oh, I'm sorry. We have <laughs> ordinances for referral to committee. Um, What I'd like to do, if, there's, if there are no objections, are to take these salary ordinances and move them as a group to the committees. I move to refer Second. as a group those documents. Okay, seconded. Um, discussion. Just hold on for a second. Um, I would like to also have these go to finance. Thank you. So we'll just add. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so the motion is to to refer these out as a group to ordinance and finance. Is there any discussion? Nope. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Now we have updates from committee chairs. We'll move to information requests. New business. Motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 